test, 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 test. It's okay. Yo. Hello. I think I'm, I'm one minute early, but uh, why not? Big Daddy's in the house. Turn some lights on. Get some light on the subject. Another experiment in remote technology. What's everybody? Hello, anyone here? I'm here. another uh ah, gallery view okay i'm doing gallery view this time okay um what's up nate nothing much uh, how you are you on, what you doing on a saturday at uh what time is it your time um it's 10 a.m where i am so i'm oh, stuck Lord. Here. i'm stuck here in California. so <laughs> <laughs> Well, that uh, don't say that to a guy from uh, New Hampshire because they'll they'll tell you, oh, all the reasons you need to move to New Hampshire. <laughs> I you ever got that? that? You ever got the peer pressure, like why haven't you moved here yet, or whatever? I usually get the um, why haven't you moved to Texas yet? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what's so much better about Texas than a? Uh, Tommy Fornia. Uh, I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> I mean, the weather's worse. Um, everyone says the taxes are better, but I mean, every, every state you go to, there's always a hodgepodge. Like they, they mix up the property tax, sales tax, and state income tax, and they, they, they find their sweet spot that they can use to, you know, extract the most uh sugar from the venison yeah that's true plus there's also fire ants i remember getting attacked by those when i was last in texas yeah and it's hotter and the people in texas have an accent they're like that kind of hick accent at least in california it's like a surfer dude accent which sounds slightly less illiterate but who knows plus there's uh tornadoes and Texas, depending yeah. on where you are. Yeah, but in California, the traffic is apparently worse, but it's more beautiful. So, I mean, there's a reason people live there. True, despite the fact that it's increasingly more expensive. True, but that seems to be like a natural problem, right, that will solve itself. Yeah. Just negative feedback. That's the kind of feedback we like, negative feedback, right? Mm-hmm. But people never respond. Like you think like, come on, guys, it's too expensive here. Why aren't you moving out? <laughs> they, find, they find a way, and then they complain. Well, I live in this apartment down the – and then the government should subsidize me. So, so it's all, there's always a – you know, a never a clear-cut clear -cut thing. I mean, Austin, from what I heard, is uh, a lot more like uh, California's economy increasingly yeah i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing hey i'm i mean here i mean i know there has been a proposal to split california up into like three states i'm either for that or we could just secede from the union yeah but then you would have to leave because if you secede then you're going to be even worse yeah that's that's where it sucks <laughs> yeah i guess you could have cauliflower and i thought colorado was one of the original names for one of those california uh regions but then colorado took it so hmm. there's oh. there's always a libertarian plan out there like how we can just come up with a plan that we can make everything better you know a floating nation or honduras or uh move to new hampshire i mean there's always some kind of 
pie in the sky bullshit. <laughs> True. Hey, no matter how powerful the government gets, the black and gray markets could never be stopped. No, I know. So it's like, so why move? And then they say, well, move because you can be around other libertarians. And I'm like, I don't know if you found the best marketing ploy because, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather live around Republicans and then have the libertarians deal with me on policy. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans know how to, like, you know, walk their, their, their poodles on a leash and, like, you know, follow the rules. I mean, I'm kind of the same thing, uh, given the fact that when I became libertarian, uh, those who were Democrats, once they found out, they wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. And Republicans were eager to uh, debate me, and they even welcomed me at their events, though I barely yeah, attended. I, I, I find that's a – yeah, but that's an activist thing. Like that's at certain events. I mean in neighborhoods and regular life and – employment places at restaurants and other places of gatherings people yeah. tend to kind of mind their own business and like they like they find a way to get along true true now let me just ask you a question i'm trying to understand this technically did you yeah. un unmute your video yourself or did i do that um uh, i i muted it myself okay so. won't you unmute if you want to I'm trying oh. to test something. I'm trying to test my, my recording abilities. Yeah, and then I did unmute, so. So, yeah. It's... Oh, I can see. I can ask. So, I'm just trying to learn this, this interface. What do, you, what do you think about the, uh, the, the Zoom or other platforms? Um, oh, there you are. No, that's not you. That's Ivan. Ivan's muted on audio, but he's not muted on. Oh, there we go. Yeah, let's do some. Let's do some faces. That I can check out my software. Hold on, I'm trying this Mark guy here. I know I should give more of a, a heads up for these things. I'm just. What I'm thinking about is doing a weekly thing, right? Uh, if it would make sense, kind of a libertarian theory bullshit session. Make sense? Yeah. No? What do you think? Hey, I think I think that's I'm up for that. Yeah, so probably I should say more than thirty minutes ahead of time I'm gonna do this thing. Okay, so this is – the reason I'm doing this, this is the gallery view, and I recorded it last time, but it was only me, and I don't understand why. I mean I'm pretty smart, but I, I don't always understand these different systems. Okay, so let's see if this is recording properly. I guess you're all being recorded, so beware. It's saying that it's recording on my end. So. Oh, it is. It gives you a notice. Okay. Yep. Could you opt out of it, or what does it do? Um, no, I cannot opt out. Mm. And no one is using a background except for me. Is that like the old dorky geeky thing to do? Should I not use a background? I don't even know how to use uh, background. Oh, okay. Well, it's a setting in a... Uh, in, uh, Zoom. I'm actually not sure why – to be honest, I'm not sure why Zoom is so popular all of a sudden because we had Google Hangouts. We had Skype. We had lots of other platforms, so I don't really know why Zoom got popular all of a sudden. Well, I think that Skype is uh, the worst in, uh, in among all this because Skype um, can give uh, – I think it gives uh, information uh, to government, uh, so it's pretty bad and have um, um, pre pretty bad insecurity. Yeah, I know, but most people wouldn't know the difference, and that wouldn't be a technical barrier. 
and nobody knows what Zoom is doing either, right? I think they're trying to get more secure with with uh, security. Nate, you're still you're still muted. Is that your intention, or is that just a, a screw up at my end? Um, I never muted uh, since. Oh, uh, let me see. Ask to start video. What happens here? I just hit ask to start video. Uh, something just popped up. The host asked you to start your video. Yeah. So, I wonder what happens if I say start my video. Let's see what happens. Oh. Apparently, my camera's not working. <laughs> what can that be? What do, what, what do most people do on these things? Do they use their iPhones, their phones, their iPads, their computers? What, what do most people do when they do these things? Um, I think it depends. Uh, people could use their phones with this from what I heard. And uh, so. Oh, hold on. I've got several admit requests. Let me just say admit all. Okay, hold on. Ah, here we go. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I just I, I'm I'm the master of communications apparently, and I just realized I had to admit people. I don't know how I can make this automatic. Next time, I'll figure it out. So this is it, iterative process. I like the green screen. It's not a green screen. Oh. It's what? just automatic. So what's interesting is, so I have a. Uh, an iPad, an iPhone, and two old MacBooks and this MacBook Air. And when you load Zoom on the MacBook, the new Mac, the old MacBooks, you get a warning that you can't use the digital background because the processor is not a quad core. You have to have a green screen, green screen, which I don't have. I see. Hi, everybody. So, I'm Alex Miller. Hey, Alex. What's up, man? Not much. Taking a break from the baby. Did you did you unmute yourself or did I do that? I'm just curious how this works technically. Did I what myself? Sorry. Unmute. Uh, yeah, I think I did. Okay, good. Because I see a lot of people have mutes, but I assume they're doing that themselves because I don't want to shut anyone out on accident. Hold on. There's another person. I got to admit. Yeah, you okay. can mute and unmute yourself. I get mute. it. But if I say unmute all, is that what people want? Let me, let me try this. All right. Everyone's unmuted. But if we hear a crying baby in the background, then they're going to be – everyone will hate them. You know how that goes. Well, that it, actually – sent uh, a notification. Uh, forcibly unmute you. So I just uh, – it gave me an option, and I said stay muted. Well, I don't I, want my microphone going when – Somebody else is talking. So. I got it. I got it. Well, how's everybody? How's everybody doing? Pretty good. We could just shoot the shit, or if anyone has any libertarian stuff to uh, jabber about, I'm okay with that too. Just another uh, open discussion, or sure. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Um, I think I, I think I got a very interesting one. Um, it's actually uh, from uh, quite a bit of uh, research that I've been doing as I'm looking for um, uh, other libertarians uh, that I might read up on. Um, and uh, in my, uh, uh, through my research, I came across um, uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Well, I think I think uh, pretty much everybody that I've been around in my circles uh, pretty much know who he is. He was the founder of uh, mutualism. Um, he was most famous for uh, stating that property was theft. Um, and usually, when I, whenever I hear something like that, I get turned off because uh, I firmly believe in property rights. But then I do, 
I do a little more digging around, and it turns out uh, he's talking about state property, right? You know, more like the property that uh, you know the state uh, has taken over or owns. Uh, he's saying that that's property. He firmly believed in uh, individual, the individual's right to uh, property. Um, and what's funny is um, I look at him and it, it, I'm just reminded about, uh, about Hoppe because ha I know that Hoppe is probably uh, the most misunderstood uh, in anarcho-capitalist circles, and then I uh, and and uh, I'm bothered by the fact that uh, uh, there I have run into status, or or more specifically, uh, like say paleoconservatives or nationalists, actually quoting from him from Hoppe uh, to back up or uh, justify the use of force or or among other th or among other things cuz uh, uh I don't need to go into that cuz I debated too many but anyways um and then I look at Proudhon and strangely enough I notice marxists <laughs> quoting from Proudhon to justify uh uh you know some of their positions so I'm starting to go so I guess like Hoppe, even though uh, Proudhon obviously had some inconsistencies, uh, Proudhon is also largely misunderstood. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Stefan? Uh, I mean, I view, uh, I view a lot of things through the, through the intellectual property lens, not just because it's a litmus test, but because well, in a way it is like, um, so Proudhon and some of the early, some of these early thinkers, like they're really good on a lot of things, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, but for example, you'll see even hints of it with uh, Tucker and Proudhon, like they're, they're against monopoly, they call it monopoly. And yes, yeah, they'll include that. They'll include property rights in that. And I think even as libertarians, we could um, we could see why they're doing that. Because yeah, I was initially turned off by this property is theft mantra too, because I assumed it was just a lefty, you know, anti-capitalist thing. Um, but I think the probably the best way to look at it is they saw the state institutions emerging and the way they classified property and just kind of formalized official property rights in a way that actually ended up taking people's rights from them, right? So for example, this whole idea of the, which I haven't studied myself a lot. I, I probably need to, but my, my sense is that this enclosure movement, like in 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 England and in Europe, so you have these estates, and everything is sort of more decentralized and evolved over time. Like you have the hunting rights and the tra and the, and the and the traversing rights of the peasants. Like people can walk across, they can hunt, um, they can cross, and then you have uh, the, the main rights, which the the feudal sort of common law property system divided up, which divided things up in different ways. But if the government just comes in and just says, okay, here's the line. You can put up a wall, stop A, B, and C. You can see how um, granting these rights in an absolute way to one subset of the rights holders could be a taking of property from usufructuaries or people with easement rights or something like that. So you could say property is theft because state granted and enforced absolute property without a nuance and without recognizing previous rights amounts to theft because you're taking use rights from people that used to have it before. So. I could see some kind of nuanced argument being made that way if it was informed from a libertarian Austrian perspective, which it almost never is. It's always informed by this kind of quasi-lefty 
perspective. So you can never quite trust it. But still, you know, so I sort of think that these guys and so for example, uh, Proudhon and at least uh, Benjamin Tucker, like, so he says he's against patent and copyright rights. Now, I have my own argument and there's modern arguments you could you could advance, but what's his argument? His argument is that it's just a monopoly. But the same argument could be used by him to argue against rights in land. And if you take it too far, you could argue this mutualist or this Georgist stuff where, you know, any property right in land per se is unjust because you're giving someone some exclusive right over something they di they didn't create and they didn't enhance the value of, and therefore there needs to be a, you know uh, this Georgia's property tax. So I'm always leery of people that that have this uh, opposition to property and say property is theft, although in certain extreme cases. I can understand why they're leery of the state coming in and institutionalizing like these walls, right, which might intrude on the previous uh, easement rights of different peoples. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a complicated thing, which would require a lot of study, um, which everyone who does it. It's interesting, but they're usually just mainstream thinkers, and so you have to read what they say with a grain of salt. Yeah, I mean – Sort of my take on it. Yeah, I mean Proudhon, uh, there were several things that I found to be kind of like incomplete or vague. So I'm like, eh, maybe he's talking about this, maybe he's talking about that, but I don't know for sure because uh, there, were, there were several things where I'm like, eh, maybe he's not very clear. So, I mean, if he was like saying, if he was like talking about, say, eminent domain, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure we all have all heard of her Trump uh, co uh, constantly talking about <laughs> how eminent domain was a good thing. Um, and it usually involves a uh, government basically stealing uh, land or, st or it could probably be applied to something else as well. Um, I, I could see if, if, I mean, if Proudhon was like talking about eminent domain, I would see, I could definitely see what he means by property is theft. Yeah, but of course, so uh, this is another issue. Um, I don't think that's what he was talking about, to be honest. It wasn't eminent yeah. domain. Um, it was just the formalizing of property rights. Um, and this sort of hostility towards uh, well, this distinction that some thinkers in the sort of 1800s, you know, that they had towards land. I mean, look, when you tell me I'm against monopolies like Benjamin Tucker did, okay, and to my mind, that's okay. You're against copyright and patent. Good for you. And land. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Land mm -hmm. is not – it's like it's not the same thing. Uh, maybe the government didn't handle the allocation right, but land is definitely a scarce resource in which there should be property rights allocated in some kind of way. Maybe you could take into account passage rights and easement rights and hunting rights or whatever that had been accumulated over time. But that would be an, then you would set that up and there'd be a negotiation, right? But um, but yeah, the, the this is the – and look, the problem is, look, uh, these guys 100, 200 years ago, they didn't even have the benefit of modern, say, the Austrian sensibilities. So you can't be too harsh on them. I mean they did what they could. Now, Elias under Spooner I could be harsh about because his IP views are completely insane. Like Benjamin Tucker, who was his, his co-contemporary, got it mostly correct. I think, like on IP, right? So he realized that's a monopoly. Spooner went over the deep end. Okay, yeah. so um, so maybe you could give Tucker uh, the the benefit of the doubt. Like you didn't quite get it right, but then he was before the Austrian age. He's before the modern libertarian radical age. Pretty goddamn good. Okay, um, but Spooner, no, that like there's all he's totally incoherent. I mean, look, I love I used to love Spooner, like probably everyone 
that's our type does. But to be honest, the more I read from Tucker, like, I mean, Spooner, there's almost nothing that I like about Spooner. Uh, I mean, he had this bizarre argument. So he tried to start a post office. Who cares? Um, he he was against the Constitution, I guess, but he tried to use the Constitution to argue that slavery was unconstitutional, which is, frankly, I think a stupid argument. I mean I would make the argument if one of my clients was a slave. I mean I would do whatever I could, but it's really it's just a stupid argument. It's like saying that taxation is unconstitutional. It's just – unfortunately, it's just not. I mean the constitution is not libertarian, so he had this sort of dichotomy in himself. Like he wanted to – he wanted to hold up the constitution to the people that had been deluded in thinking it was some kind of constitutional uh, – I'm sorry, libertarian invention. And then criticize them when they fell short. But the truth is there's no, there's no reason to think it was constitutional in the first place. Like the argument that slavery was unconstitutional is, I just think, ridiculous. So that's one argument by Spooner. Uh, Spooner's argument for IP is not only ridiculous, it's just wrong. So he was wrong on that. And Spooner argued that um, by contract law principles, you can't justify the consent theory of – the Constitution, and that's fine as far as it goes, but you know, I think he doesn't go far enough because you couldn't justify the Constitution even on normal. In other words, uh, he took for granted the the common law view of contract, which I think needs to be revised as well, which Rothbard tried to do and others. So he was too early, so you can't be too critical. But there's almost nothing in Spooner that really makes sense. I mean Spooner ends up saying that the Constitution hasn't restrained the government. Okay, fine. That's true. So what? So you start a post office? So you favor IP? So you say slavery is unconstitutional even though… You admit that the Constitution is not libertarian. Like if the Constitution is not libertarian, why would it happen to be that it outlawed slavery? Just coincidence? So I, I admire this early spirit of Spooner, but I just personally don't get almost anything out of this guy. Stephen, can I ask you a question about Bitcoin? Sure. So – there's a lot of talk about the value of running a full node in the Bitcoin community. And um, my understanding is the reason you want to do that is because when someone sends you Bitcoin, you want to verify that you actually got it. Um, you also want to choose the rules that you're using so that nobody tries to create more Bitcoin for free or change the rules somehow. So my question is like a legal one. Um, if you were to agree on selling Bitcoin, say, um, uh, whose node would you use? Do, do you have to specify a node to say whether or not the agreed amount of Bitcoin has been received at the agreed address or, you know, like if, if I say, okay, I'm going to send you a hundred dollars and you're going to send me X Bitcoin to this dress. Um, you know, who, how do we know that I got the Bitcoin? Does that make sense? Um, I'm not sure why you think it's a legal question. I mean, what's the, so you're well, asking me well, well, like, when you participate in Bitcoin, how can you know A, B, and C? Why, why, why do you think that's a legal question? Well, I, I think or, what, or what's a, legal a about it? Like, it's. A, I think um, if you want to be technical about, if you want to avoid disagreements, you'd have to write up a contract to say mm. this is this is what the the transaction is going to look like. Because, I mean, theoretically, we could agree to trade Bitcoin for dollars. And I could send you the dollars and, you know, that's pretty verifiable. We can, we have a third party to trust the, the banking system. But if you send me Bitcoin and 
I say I don't, I, I didn't receive it. How mm. can you, how can you prove that I did? Or, or vice versa, I think. Right. But t so again, to me, the, the question, how can you prove that you did to me is not, I mean, I don't know if that's a legal question. It's, um, uh, we, we, I think that we all do things all the time that we take for granted or that are systems that just work, right? Like if you go spend a credit card payment here and there, right? Or if you send your friend a $35 Venmo payment or PayPal payment or something like that, if someone just said, how can you be sure that's a different question about any legal issues. Um, um, okay. Well, bef bef before I pontificate on this, and and, and what I one thing I, I respect and admire and like, I like people that admit what they don't know. So I know certain things, and I don't know certain things um, about technology and the systems. I have a, an opinion, but is there anyone here online who wants to chime in before I? Opine? Anyone here who has an opinion about my, this, this, this issue? Yes, uh, may I try, try to answer the question? Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think uh, the question is about uh, connection uh, of uh, technical part of Bitcoin and uh, um, legal uh, part of contracts. Uh, and um, Mm, I have at least two ideas of how to connect uh, two parts. Um, first of all, you can try to describe in your contract, uh, in your legal contract, uh, what is uh, to receive Bitcoin? What does it mean? So you can specify uh, mm, the, uh, you can copy the white paper of Bitcoin and you can specify uh, some. Uh, some notes uh, which can be used to verify. Um, and uh, if you want to, uh, to be completely sure that, uh, that you received some Bitcoins, uh, you should specify the Bitcoin correctly in contract. But also you can use um, oracles. So some trusted uh, third parties. Mm. Uh, uh, the oracle is a typical way to connect uh, digital cryptocurrency world with the legal world. So, for example, uh, uh, specify blockstream.info says that X Bitcoin was, was, rece was received at, at, at address Y. And then w once that's, that condition is satisfied or not, we'll, we'll, we'll say whether uh, Bitcoin has been received or not. In the simplest uh, case, uh, uh, you can uh, require just one uh, HTTP request to the single uh, website, uh, which is uh, 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 Blockchain Explorer. And, uh, but but uh, it's better to use uh, some, uh, some, platform, some platform which is uh, Specialized in uh, in such type of um, uh, of activity, uh, it's called Oracle, uh, mm -hmm. and it uh, receives its commission uh, because of uh, um, because of correct um, answers. So it isn't it is um, it is not in their interest to uh, to fool you. Okay, thanks, Alex. But of course, of course, the the best uh, option is to specify uh, blockchain completely in contract, and uh, uh, and to force uh, any um, uh, any jury which can um, which may uh, resolve uh, your contract uh, to. To repeat the steps, technical steps, uh, I mean, uh, installing a Bitcoin node, full node, and verify uh, this process in their computers. 
it doesn't uh, require a trusted third party. And that's my answer. Mm, yeah, it makes sense. Well, I would so so my take on this is always with a bit of humility, knowing what I don't know about these technical protocols, but having a general idea of the way these things work. Um, so you bring up contracts because that's the natural way to do it, right? And everyone's used to having contracts understood in a certain way, usually according to the positive law and the way that uh, things are done now. Um, of course, I believe that the right way to look at all of this is the Rothbardian libertarian way of understanding and, and the Misesian way, to be frank, understanding that we live in a world of scarce resources and we, we use as actors, as just human actors, we, we, we understand this and we use these resources when we can, right? We have possession or use of them to get things done. And then when we have society, we have normative rules that come into place, which is property rights rules, right? That's where the property aspect comes in, like the contract aspect. So a contract to me, according to Rothbard and Evers and the way I understand it, in the end can be understood as just a manipulation or transfer. And this is important. The transfer can be permanent, right, or temporary. It can be partial or complete, right? So ultimately, it could be permanent and, 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 and complete, like you just sell something to someone else. It's an alienation. Now, in the law, the law distinguishes between these things. The law says there's lease, there's rent, there's loan, there's uh, commodatum. There's all kinds of different… Uh, there's easements, there's usufructs, right? Um, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's lifetime estates, there's the naked ownership, and there's the full ownership. The law divides these things up, and the typical perspective on this is that you view the, your property rights as a bundle. We call it a bundle of sticks or a bundle of fags, right? Like… It's a bundle of sticks that you can pluck out one and you can divide them up. But that's just a metaphorical way of describing the fact that contract allows us to basically have co-ownership. Right Now, to me as a libertarian and as a fundamental lawyer, not as a day-to-day -day lawyer, which has to deal with the existing regimes that we need to use to get things done… But as a day-to-day -day, – as a fundamental lawyer and as a libertarian thinker, to me, they're all just different flavors of ownership, and ownership is the right – the legal right, the legally recognized right to, to use a resource. And by contract between different parties, you can divide it up, and you can split it up in different ways. Okay, So that's the background of what contract is, right? So – the question is, do you bother to have a written contract or an ex explicit contract when you do these deals with these exchanges? I mean, so you say – you talk about Bitcoin. Are we talking about actual Bitcoin itself or the Lightning Network second layer stuff or something on Coinbase or something uh, – some kind of private exchange between you and I using the key system? Uh, it depends. I think it just depends. Um, usually, we don't rely upon any background legal framework except maybe for fraud. We rely upon the system that works, right? If 99.99% of the time, if you transfer half a Bitcoin to me by this mechanism and it works, we're not going to bother with papering over the deal with a legal contract. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think both of your answers make total yep. sense. Um, yeah. Uh, however, neither of them address the seemingly widespread advice that it's super important to run your own full node. Right. Um, yeah. So, 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 right. So then let's get to that. So what's the, so 
maybe restate your question. So what's your question about running a full node in a legal sense? What's, what's the question? Well, it's not even a legal sense. It's just <laughs> why bother? When, when, when any, when, when, you know, deals are being made to buy and sell Bitcoin, they're all working. Um, you know, when, when Bitcoin forked, uh, third party applications, whether it was Trezor or Coinbase allowed you to access both branches of, of the, uh, of the Bitcoin super ecosystem. Uh, you didn't need to run your full node. Um, you know, no, as far as I know, nobody's ever, ever uh, claimed to have sent Bitcoin and, and there been an altercation that, yes, I sent you that Bitcoin. Well, I didn't get it. You know, that, that I've never heard of that before. So, and, and there's, and there's lots of oracles, um, you know, whether it's uh, blockchain.info or blockstream.info or there's lots of, uh, chain explorers that, that can be used as oracles to uh, settle dis any disputes. Um, and as far as I know, they agree 99.99% .99 of the time. So I, I would suppose, I mean, if you're just a regular person using it, having a little bit, having a lot, but you're, you're doing it on your own, there's, that's one thing, right? You can, you can decide to be more and more secure or not. Um, I would I would imagine that if you're some kind of custodial if you have some kind of custodial relationship, you're some part of, part of some kind of business that's an intermediary or a second layer lightning type thing, or a Coinbase. At at that point, you need to get serious about what your relationship is with your customers and what your obligations are. Like for this is probably a bad example because Coinbase is not favored by most hardcore Bitcoin people. But I, lo I looked into this because I'm a big, uh, I'm interested in the uh, fractional reserve banking idea. And I've heard, you know, no one quite understands anything. But so like Bit uh, Coinbase, for example, according to their terms of service, what they say, if I understand this correctly, and I'm w open to be corrected, they say this, people that deposit their funds to Coinbase, um, the online part is insured, but the cold storage part is not, which makes sense to me because if they have $17 billion of assets that they're kind of a holding at, at the behest of their customers, there's no way they can insure that. Um, so what they do is they insure 1% of it, the 1% that they keep liquid and the other 99% they keep in cold storage somehow. Now that's subject to the risk of embezzlement or some kind of catastrophic failure, I guess, but it's less risk from some online hack because it's not online, something like that. So, right, for example. Um, so I don't know if they're at the chance if if they're the type of company that could become another Mount Gox or whatever. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't know many people that would hold a large volume of their personal Bitcoin wealth at a Coinbase. Some people, some people probably still do. I mean, you might keep ten thousand dollars there, but you're not going to keep seventy-five million dollars there. Is my guess for most people, just because of the risk, because it's not insured. I mean, literally, it's not insured. One percent is insured. That's my understanding. So, but they do seem to try to have a careful custodial relationship and define their terms. And if you look closely enough, it seems to me that they're 100% reserves. Now that doesn't mean embezzlement's not a problem, but at least they specify we're not a fraction reserve bank, right? So I imagine that different custodians and people with different relationships that manage other people's money would have contractual relationships that specify all this. And then you have layers of insurance and security and whatever. That, that's how I look at it as a, like as a lawyer looking at it from the outside who's not a tech expert on how these Bitcoin companies uh, work. And by the way, nine-tenths of the so-called Bitcoin experts that I hear that claim to be experts, they all uh, – nine-tenths of them seem – a little sketchy to me. So that's why I don't really even trust, you know, because if you ask them a clear question, you, you rarely get a clear answer.
Well, thanks. That was a great answer. I have another question, unless someone else wants to go. Uh, I have a question, yes. Uh, uh, I have a question about borders. Um, of course, anarcho-capitalism uh, means that you have no uh, borders, at least, uh, at least no uh, government borders or public borders, only private. Um, but uh, in, uh, in current tradition of uh, land, um, uh, of of land property, uh, you can't uh, build private borders similar to uh, government uh, borders. I mean, uh, you you only can uh, create border in size of 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 your plot of land, which is uh, uh, which is not very big and. Um, I mean that uh, private borders doesn't uh, uh, doesn't uh, play the same role as government borders, uh, but uh, there is uh, one important uh, feature of government borders, which I think is uh, is uh, way important to the. Uh, to the state institution itself. It, uh, government can control who can, um, who can join your country. And um, why I think this is important to the institution of, of state itself, uh, because uh, I think it's important because when uh, a lot of people which, uh, which doesn't agree with your views on on the law on the uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, which which word better describe this uh, sorry my English uh, which do, which doesn't share your views on how the society should uh, should be governed uh, when a lot of people uh, which doesn't agree with you uh, join your country. Uh, the grounds uh, which your country, which your laws state on, are um, can, can be um, declined in, in some way. I mean, uh, uh, when you give uh, the voting right to d different people, they can vote for some laws which you don't like, and um, and. When you have a, uh, a state, uh, it's not uh, the problem. I think uh, we can um, uh, save the borders. But uh, when you don't have state, uh, it can be a threat for the anarcho-capitalist society uh, because, uh, yes, uh, in anarcho-capitalist society, we don't have positive law, but uh, anyway, we have institutions that enforce law. Uh, I mean, judges, I mean, uh, police, which can be private and, and uh, courts and judges can be private too. Uh, but uh, which mechanisms can, uh, can save the libertarian ideals in in such uh, society if we don't have borders that's my questions I'll, I'll give it a quick shot i mean that's a that's a deep issue and it's one that one could despair about um if you want a guarantee for a b and c there may be no guarantees right i mean obviously the the issue is um yeah, you say a government can stop immigration, but they can't stop. Well, I don't know if they can stop that either as a practical matter in reality. In human civilization, people tend to move 
you can distinguish conceptually between the trade of goods and services and the movement of people. And in today's societies, the movement of people, even in older societies, like if you have people that move as a people, as a culture from one group to another, uh, there could be a, a clash or a conflict, right? Or different visions. And over time, the minority cultures uh, tend to gain political power or rights. And in the West, in, in modern society, of course they do because of citizenship and democracy. I mean, theoretically, you could say, well, let's just have people that can come back and forth, but they don't have citizenship rights. But in the long term, that's unrealistic because they breed with the locals and everything changes and so the question is, how can you guarantee the safeguarding of, of, of liberalism, basically, which is a cultural precondition to at least some societies in the West in the last couple of hundred years? I don't know if there's a way to guarantee anything. Um, maybe it will be lost eventually just because of this process, or maybe the rest of the world will become more cosmopolitan and more and more liberal and that's the only way we can assume the world will be that cultures and ethnicities and tribalistic gap, uh, you know associations that we cling to now will become less important in a more cosmopolitan modern world that's my hope my personal hope is that that's our only hope but that means that your religion, your ethnicity, your background, all that will fade in importance and become more like window dressing, which some people are bothered by that because they will lose their cultural identity, which they cling to. Some people like me think that that's a good thing because it will reduce the importance of these tribalistic intergroup hostilities. But what we can do about it, I don't know what we can do. I personally don't think we can do anything about it. All we can do is in our own lives do certain things and promote ideas that are there for people to take as humanity hopefully keeps expanding outwards. That's a general answer, but that's that's sort of my bizarre cosmopolitan um, – view. I, I am concerned about immigration of different peoples into the Western nations because of their political affiliations and because they will have political power and they could ruin everything. Yeah, or this, this could ruin everything. Yes, I'm concerned about that. On the other hand, there's 200 countries in the world and you have trends that happen around the country of the world. Whichever one gets the mixture right will tend to dominate, whether it's South America or Africa or America or South America or India or China or Asia. Who knows? Who knows? Um, we would like to think it would be Western Europe and America because of our liberal tradition, I guess, but I, there's no guarantee that, that that will be the one that will dominate in the future. This uh, this topic reminded me of a passage I just read in in Hoppe, uh, the democracy, the God that failed, which I've been loving. But when I got to this passage, I was sort of shaking my head, and I was wondering what you guys think about it. He says uh, he he talks about okay. Moreover, while interracial, tribal, and ethnic marriages were formerly rare and restricted to the upper class upper strata of the merchant class. With the arrival of bureaucrats and bums from various racial, tribal, and ethnic backgrounds in the capital city, the frequency of inter-ethnic inter marriage will increase, and the focus of inter-ethnic sex, even without marriage, will increasingly shift from the upper class of merchants to the lowest classes. Rather than genetic luxuration, the consequence is incre increased genetic pauperization. I don't know. Sounds like he's, uh, uh, just, what do you guys think about that? It seems like he's against interracial. I, I mean, I, I, why? I mean, let, let me just say something quickly about that. Um, 
I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't pretend to be a specialist in, I, you have to know a lot or have a lot of opinions at least about culture and history to have these judgments. Um, um, but I think that the sensibility there is this, it's looking at this world that we have, which is not monolithic and it's not anarchistic. It's anarchistic in an international sense in that we have different tribal groupings of people or different country groupings of people, right? Um, and in that view, if you're an anarchist, like you have this ideal anarchist view, which is what I I have personally, um, a cosmopolitan world of individualists who basically have moved past this primitive stage of society. But in the meantime, <clears throat> we count on counterbalancing um, groups that fight against each other, right? That, that balance each other's power. I mean, in the US system, this was the the legislative, uh, the, the constitutional idea of separation of powers and balance of powers, right? Legislative, executive, judicial, and then vertically, federalism, et cetera, right? But not, not just that, there was also the idea that we have civil institutions that balance power against each other. So you have the church and you have private society and they balance against the power of the state. So you have this vision of all these different counterbalancing I think uh, uh, it's called files, P H Y L E S, by uh, 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 Dave, one of the, one of the uh, Austrian. Uh, I forgot his name now, but um, so it's just the idea that so you have the church, you have the state, you have the private civil society, you have vertical separation of powers, you have ethnic groups, you have all these groups that fight against each other. Now, fighting is not per se good, but having a separation of powers, you could see how that would limit the power of any one of an, of any one group. And so if you think that that's the backdrop, then you could be concerned that that could be upset by one group moving in, getting civil liberties, getting citizenship rights, getting voting rights, and just totally uh, uprooting the existing order by voting, right? effectively by voting, which is what's happening in the West to a degree because of immigration. On the other hand, if you stop immigration, that causes problems too. So all these problems, to my mind, are caused by the existence of the state. Like no matter what you do, you're screwed. Like if you allow open borders between states, I think most of us who are realistic are, are aware that there could be some problems that could emerge from that. Like if you have a bunch of illiterate people that believe in Islam and <laughs> religious theocracy who move somewhere and they have the right to vote within a generation or two, you're screwed, right? I mean, to, to put it starkly. On the other hand, if you don't allow immigration, then you're restricting private property rights and you have to have a police state and walls to stop it. So all these solutions are all problematic but they're all problematic because we have a state and a state and a, demo and a democratic welfare state. So in the end, the only hope is that we outgrow it naturally or that we come up with a solution politically that ends it, which I don't think is realistic because political logic doesn't end. I mean public choice economics has a point. There's a reason why people choose what they choose, right? And we maybe came out of the trees too soon. So, so I hear what you're saying. I'm not. I. I so I. I think the a, a charitable way to look at what Hoppe was saying was, as just a matter of fact, if you let these groups that are tribalistic in their nature, right, everyone sticks to each other. Then, if you let them mix together, then you're going to have conflict, and this is the history of humanity to a degree. Uh, European inter-European inter civil wars and religious strife and conflict. Um, I, it's it's not like you say the solution to this is to stifle civil liberties and have a a one-world police state that prevents it, because that solution is not good either. 
I, so I don't, I don't uh, yeah. I mean, I respect your answer, but it doesn't really make sense to me. If you're saying we want to minimize conflict between two groups and two individuals from each of those groups are saying we want to get married. I mean, isn't that a great first step in reducing conflict? I mean, my personal view is yes, because I am a modern Western cosmopolitan guy. Uh, but I've known, I've known Muslims and Jews and Indians and Catholics and Protestants, and they all make a big fuss when there's an intermarriage, right? Blacks and whites and everything. So apparently it's a thing <laughs> that people make a big deal about this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, of course. I would like a world where everyone was a Randian super uberman and didn't care about your background or upbringing or your color. And no one would even – you wouldn't care about your religion because no one would have religion. We would have outgrown this by now. Um, but in the current world, it, 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 it gives rise to, to problems. Um, and just, just – I mean to my mind, the bare fact that – uh, the minority populations and subcultures that tend to move and gravitate towards the West because the West is more – is richer. This is what happens, right? They move here because of resources. But the fact that they come here because they come from a culture that is poorer, because they had less progressive uh, cultural and economic – intersocial ideas, right? They just didn't become as Western capitalist individualist as early as as certain other cultures did. They import some of their views with them. And yeah, you could say it's a great mosaic. It's a it's a, it's 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 just beautiful that we have Indians and Chinese and 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 Iranians, you know, um, and blacks and and Mexicans and everyone's all working together harmoniously. Yeah, it makes for great restaurants down the corner, sure. You know, I mean, fine. Uh, but if you believe that that tends to result ultimately in civil strife, then that's not a good thing either. But what's the solution? I mean, to my mind, the solution is individualism and private property rights and cosmopolitanism, everyone advancing and becoming individuals. So I'm sorry. I, this is a big divergence from your original question, which is really about um, running your own node. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Great. You should run your own node. <laughs> Thanks. I enjoyed this. I, I have to believe, but I really enjoyed this. Yeah, we have to cut it short anyway. It's, it's an hour into this. Anyone else with anything else before we have to uh, go? Um, I, I got one last thing before I have to go as well. Um, so... Uh, one of the things that I have gotten into uh, pretty heated debates with uh, uh, nationalists, I guess, on which is uh, uh, in regards to, um, and as well as uh, libertarians and anarchists, uh, to my shocking surprise, <laughs> um, in regards to culture. Um, and what, what what's strange is that uh, uh, it kind of stems from the fact that uh, uh, you know, like last time uh, we talked about the use of the left right paradigm, and they often, and I don't know if this is what their argument is, but uh, based on what I am seeing, they want to refer to themselves as quote unquote right wing because they want to preserve culture. But I kept trying to explain to them that there's no way you're going to do it, especially with the monopoly on power. And I even tried to explain to them that uh, whatever culture uh, you identify with or want to be a part of could potentially be preserved under hierarchies or covenant communities or even uh, a voluntary commune. Um, would I be correct in um, assessing that uh, culture could be um, preserved under 
hierarchies? Oh Lord, that's a big question. That's that's beyond my pay grade. Um, I'm skeptical of that idea, but I don't pretend to be an expert in it. Uh, no, I think that that's futile to try to any culture you try to preserve is on the way out, I think, personally. Hmm. I mean, if you have to try to preserve it, you know, if it's not natural, it's, it's like liberty. It's like libertarianism for me. Um, like, I think the whole libertarian movement, in a way, I won't say it's pointless because I'm part of it. But I don't think that we will achieve liberty by passing out pamphlets to people, you know, to or, or pestering your uncle at Thanksgiving dinner. I I don't think that, you know, the simplistic view is the way we achieve liberty is to make sure a certain threshold percentage of human beings that live in our region have read economics in one lesson. And they get the idea because number one, that's never going to happen. Never, ever, ever, ever will happen. Even when we achieve full liberty, which I think could come, most people still won't have read Henry Hazlitt. I mean, to have a simplistic marker. So I don't think we can achieve it by doing something because a public. I think public choice economics it basically has it right. Like there's prisoner's dilemma issues, there's free rider issues, there are – once you have the possibility of the state, too many people will naturally gravitate towards using that, and then it becomes a war of special interest groups against other special interest groups, which is what we have now. I don't see a way out of that. Even if you're totally rational, if you're part of Group X, you're going to want your piece of the pie because if you don't fight for it, someone else will get it, and you're going to be screwed. This is the, the problem of democracy, but it's the problem of politics in general. And why does that emerge? It emerges because it's possible, right? So my view is a little bit of a pessimistic one combined with a little bit of my bizarre optimism, which is that it's inevitable to have what we have now, but it's possible to get out of it. But my point is if we get out of it if we achieve – a larger semblance of liberty. It's not because of people pushing for it. That's what made me think of this. Like, I don't think you can preserve a culture by trying too hard. They'll just die. I mean, you know, there are some languages that are just dying. Some species die, right? Some religious practices just die. <laughs> you can't be the, the, the lone guy remaining that fights for it and hope that you can preserve it with a couple of newsletters. I mean, that was sort of the pessimistic view of Albert J. Nock and these guys. They called it the remnant or the remnant review. We're just a remnant of civilization, and all our job is to preserve this little flickering candle of liberty as a remnant that's left over when everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And that, that when the people finally rediscover it, we at least kept it alive. Now, the internet exists now, so the internet will keep it alive anyway. All of our ideas are out there. When society is ready to come back into the light again, they can rediscover our ideas. But I think if we ever achieve liberty, it won't be to the credit of libertarians. It'll just be because it's natural, and that's a good thing. In other words, if it ever comes, comes back, it's because it's natural. It doesn't have to be pushed. So that's my view. I mean, I think I'm alone in this view. I've never heard anyone else talk like me about this, but I'm extremely skeptical of this activist view that we can push things. It's like commies, like, you know, they think communism is is inevitable, but they wanted to push it a little bit earlier. Okay. So full communism is inevitable. It'll happen in 2182. But if we push it a little bit harder, we can make it happen in 2135. Okay. If that's the best you can do is push something that's inevitable a little bit earlier, why bother? Because you don't even know if that's possible. So I guess I don't believe that cultures can be perpetuated by, by effort, and I don't think liberty can be achieved by effort. 
it's got to be natural, I think. Makes sense? I mean, I'm just rambling here, but that's kind of my perspective on it. Yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying. I mean, one, uh, I mean, and just to uh, kind of finish this off, one of the, um, one of the comments that I saw kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of made me scratch my head. Like, I'm not sure if this makes sense. And, uh, one of the comments that I read was, um, that if culture is meaningless, then libertarianism can be thrown into the, thrown in the trash can but i don't see how libertarianism has anything to do with culture mm. so uh well i mean i i don't understand programmatic statements like that i mean i uh i don't know what it means to throw something in the trash can um and those I aren't think, exact I, words by the way yeah i know i'm but but uh, this gets to to me to the thick thin debate which always frustrates me um I don't think that the ideas that we value and the values that we uh, talk about as libertarians and individualists and free market types or whatever you want to call it, I don't think they're uh, totally unrelated to many other truths and disciplines and even cultural ideas. Everything's related, of course, and no one denies that. I mean just to exist, like we, we all exist. I mean what does it mean to exist? It means to have an effect on things. So if there's a universe out there – or not a universe, but a solar system or a planet that exists, it has some effect on us and vice versa, even if it's very slight. But just to exist means to have an effect on. And to be intelligent humans, we have a multitude of values and – Interdisciplinary understandings of different things – economics, math, logic, beauty, art, truth, education, history, science, whatever. You know, To, to be one of these to, – to say that I'm just this and not that is just stupid because we're not one-dimensional. We're multidimensional, all of us. So everything relates to each other, but it doesn't mean that they're not the same. I mean it doesn't mean that they're the same. right? The, the liberty dimension and the free market dimension and the beauty dimension and the left-right spectrum dimension, they're, none of them are the same. They might relate to each other, and that takes a, a conscious, rational human mind to figure these things out. So I just think that to dismiss culture is – it makes no sense because everything that we have a valid concept for that we've accumulated through the ages and through serious thought by a bunch of smart human beings who've taught us what they what they what they think to a degree by their writing and their speaking and their outpourings to ignore it would be just foolish because it's another bit of data we can use to try to understand this like this grand tapestry or mosaic of thought right and of understanding of what it means to be a human i just think that all this stuff is not so loosey goosey and new agey that we need to ignore the distinctions i mean you can say all this kind of stuff like beauty matters whatever but if you end up using it to say that, uh, therefore, I'm not completely against aggression because while I'm usually against aggression, it's not the only value. Like when someone says this kind of crap, like, okay, well, I'm in favor of the National Endowment for the Arts because I believe in the arts. And while I believe in human liberty and private property rights to some degree, it's not my, quote, only value. Then at that point, they've made a category mistake, and they're basically – they're using this kind of muddled hodgepodge of confused human thinking to justify aggression. And if there's one thing we libertarians should be against, it's against aggression. And when you have these stickers come out and say, oh, well, then you're denying that there's other values than liberty. It's like, no, I'm not denying that there's a value other than liberty. 
I'm just saying that liberty is my value, and I will not condone aggression. If you want to, you can, but when you come to my house for a party, I'm going to keep a close eye on you or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like just keep these things distinct in your mind. So that's how I look at it, which is kind of just Kinsella's uh, uh, simplistic take on things according to a lot of my uh, my haters. Hey, I had a quick question or a <clears throat> point, if you can hear me. <laughs> yep, I hear you. Hey, awesome. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess just to your point about that liberty is not going to be achieved through effort. I mean, I do think in, like, the political sense, I definitely agree with you. Like, like you said, handing out pamphlets, I don't think – I mean, not to say I, I don't think there's any value in that. I mean, I do think there is some value, but, like, hypothetically, like – taking like the uh, Michael Malice approach where he said he believes anarchy will be possible once humans can teleport from one place to another effectively. Mm. Um, I don't know how, like if that's, I, I've heard him only say it once. I don't know if that's how like boiled in, but that would be in a mass amount of effort of technological advancement. So that would be effort, but I don't know. Are you also considering that natural as well? Like, I mean, that's maybe we're splicing hairs here, but well, you know, uh, like you got me curious now. I've never um, – Michael and I are friends, and uh, I've never heard him say that. Um, now yeah, you so like I said, I've only heard him say it once, and I follow him a ton. So he, it might have just been a one-off thing that just kind of stuck with me. You can – I mean, feel free to obviously ask him about that. Well, in my, I'd say in my earlier Space Cadet, Rothbardian Space, space Cadet phase, I, I sort of thought that the only way we'll achieve liberty is um, – now this was sort of taking off on all these different libertarian projects, like uh, you know you have Atlantis floating in the ocean, and you have uh, uh, whatever they have. They always have some new project, and the problem is nine tenths of the time it's some kind of sketchy guy who's a scammer who's behind it and rips off everyone, and it, they never work out. They've never yet worked out. Floating cruise ships, Honduras, Gulf Gulf Chile. <laughs> Whatever. They never work out. But I kind of used to think the only way to do this is if we uh, we finally become a spacefaring civilization and we start having like asteroid mining colonies and all this kind of stuff, like Heinleinian type sci-fi level stuff. The problem is I don't think that the the public choice economics objections go away. Okay. Um, so my current thinking – which is very, very, very rudimentary, partly because I have no one who believes like I do, so I can't I can't really run these ideas by anyone, so I'm just like – I'm shooting in the, in the dark. But I sort of think that the only way we're going to have liberty is with an, an immense amount up the curve of the Industrial Revolution, progress, wealth, technology, cosmopolitanism in the sense of basically – People becoming a – I won't say a browner or a grayer species, but in the sense that you know, this racist, tribalist, ethnic stuff doesn't matter as much. You know, Everyone's more tolerant and more modern, and religion recedes into the background, and we basically have some kind of revolution with energy like maybe, um, maybe uh, some kind of nuclear power that's greater or um, – or robots, or AI, or nanotech, something, or 3D printing, something that basically puts us up an order or two or three of magnitude beyond where we are now, so that we expand our numbers greatly, which would be good because the division of labor, the specialization of labor, I think the more people, the better. But to do that, we might need to get off the earth. Um, and also, um, Everyone basically becomes a little king, a little omniscient, omnipotent king with their own robot armies that protect themselves so that basically people become – basically uh, they don't need the state for their survival because they can make their own food or whatever or houses or devices with their robot armies, and they can defend themselves, right? So yeah. basically everyone becomes impregnable, invulnerable. And invincible and immortal, you know, not to, I mean, not really, but like among among those dimensions. Yeah. And when that happens, I think it'll happen gradually, 
And as that happens, the state will just recede into the background. It's almost like the communist idea that the state withers, just withers away. I think the state would just become a joke. It will yeah. become ineffectual yeah. and unnecessary, and no one would need it. And people wouldn't even mind keeping the remnant state around, sort of like the guys that watch the, you know, they watch the monuments that are left over in the national parks or something like that. Like the, the King now that's sort of my crazy utopian idea of how we can achieve liberty. But you notice that that'll, that will happen because of natural tendencies among humans uh, because of technology and wealth and basically yeah. shedding our religious and our tribalist ideas that we, came, we took with us when we came out of the trees too early. Um, what concerns me about this theory is that we have never seen evidence of life in outer space, um, and that leads me to believe that there's, there's one of two things, right? There's the, it's the Fermi paradox. So either we're the only ones, which I suppose is possible. And that's why we don't hear anything, or everyone kills themselves at a certain point, yeah, which the gray goo problem, which which is what honestly I'm afraid of. And I just don't know where we are. Are we a thousand years away from the gray goo problem, or a hundred years away? You know, I don't know. So I hope that we're not facing a gray goo problem, and that it's not around the corner. Um, so that's Kinsella's bizarre worldview of things. Yeah, things. yeah, but yeah, I guess I guess to my point, like earlier, like the like you're talking about, like et, like effort, like is not like the the creation of like Bitcoin. Let's say, like I mean, it's obviously the the there's the jury's still out whether that was like a discreet like libertarian, like you know, like created out of like a libertarian philosophy, but like that, like if someone's saying like, hey, I'm gonna create something for the purpose of freedom. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? You're saying like, hey, that's natural effort anyway, so it doesn't matter why well, they did it. Yeah, and, and like, this is why the you know the, the objectivists and the IP guys hate hate people like me because they think that we're taking ideas for granted. Um, I do think that when an idea's time has come, it's going to come. And I do believe that it was – if you just look at the march of history in the last 25, 30 years, you can see the digitization of everything. Yeah. yeah. Right? And information included, and uh, and if you have a, a rudimentary understanding of, say, the Austrian take on gold and what m money is, and the problem with the Federal Reserve and central banking and inflation, I think you could see that. Look, humanity is on this part of the cusp of the industrial revolution, the information revolution, and digital money is coming someday. Yeah. So to me. It's just a detail. It doesn't matter if it's going to come in the year 2009 or in the year 2019 – or the, I'm sorry, the year 2109. It doesn't matter in the history of humanity when it comes. It will come. Um, now, it's going to come when it comes from a particular person, in this case, whoever Satoshi was, yeah. uh, and maybe that will, that will fall away and something new will come, but I think – it's hard to imagine a successful future human race that doesn't have digital money. What the details are to me is not interesting. It's interesting to me as a human being in 2020 who wants to make money off of it and wants it to happen sooner rather than later. But that's just my personal interest. I, I think ultimately it doesn't matter. Digital money will have to come just yeah. like digital, digital information came. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you in that sense. Then, yeah, we're I'm, we're definitely on the same page as you. But if I had to bet, I think it will be Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. <laughs> but it's just yeah. we're oh, early. Okay. But we can't predict a hundred years from now when Bitcoin stops inflating whether it will be the the thing that took over the world. I don't know. I hope so. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think most most end caps are rooting for uh for Bitcoin. Um. And then I guess just one other like um, footnote, which I was you made me think about was, uh, and this is something like I've just kind of started like thinking about, um, and like apparently like a lot of the big tech companies on like a very underlying level are trying to create. I believe it's called the metaverse, where basically like everyone has like, like if you're familiar with Ready Ready Player One, basically that 
yeah. um maybe maybe not in, like the dystopian like actual sense of it but like in the like hey like everybody has a version of themselves yeah. in this game and then people have jobs in this game or not game yeah. but like just you know metaverse yeah, i don't yeah. know i mean like, i'm still kind of like working through that and just like how i don't know the potential prospects for i don't know i guess a sense of liberty maybe not like real practical yeah. like or, know, or, or, or even the uh you know the idea that we we might be living in a simulation and all this kind of stuff oh, yeah that, you know? that too yeah of course <laughs> I mean, I have my own opinions about that. Look, I'm just a guy who was born in 1965 in Louisiana, so I'm a little bit old and creaky and cranky and skeptical of everything. Yeah. Um, so I am – and plus I'm, a, I'm an objectivist in the sense of um, my, my sense of skepticism about claims. Like when you when, – when people make these claims that – you know, just the implicit claim, if not explicit, that um, – it's possible that we could be living in a simulation or it's possible that we could someday someday live in a version of a simulation like this uh yeah not second life what was it called reality player one ready player one um i'm not persuaded myself that that's even possible i uh, of course uh, things are that are we have these digital lives, right? Facebook pro, uh, profiles and whatever, and we can use them and integrate them into our lives. And we have augmented reality. Whether all this idea that you could really have an experience of life that's virtual, that is virtually similar to or even better than our current life, I'm skeptical that it's even possible. Um, and I mean that as an objectivist in the sense of when you say something is possible, to me it's 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 an it's an assertion it's a positive assertion about the way the universe is. It's it's like saying it's possible that your brain in a vat, experiencing everything as a hologram or a simulation. I think that that assertion is not um, is not justified yet at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't personally know where I stand on that. I mean, I'm kind of in the air. Or I think it could, really could go either way. There was a show, there was a mini series on um, Hulu recently that kind of explored that concept. Oh, which one, which one do you mean? Devs. Which one? It's, it's called Devs, D-E-V-S. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's an, it's an eight-episode series. I didn't love it i thought the storytelling was a bit clunky here and there but that's really neither here nor there i was yeah, thinking I mean, about the one where the guys go to um digital heaven i forgot what the one's called that was that's kind of yeah that's on amazon prime I, th I think that's called like afterlife or something like that yeah afterlife yeah, yeah. that's right yeah but yeah yeah it's um yeah i don't know but just this idea know. that you could you could have you could have some kind of way of connecting all the physical inputs and outputs to your brain and simulating or re reproducing some kind of experience that's the same richness that counts um i just i i'm like logically there's nothing logically impossible about it it's just whether it's really possible like it, it would be like saying like you could predict the future if you have a big enough computer it's like yeah but but the computer might have to be as big as the universe to compute it in other words it would be the universe. In other words, the universe is a computer. That's like what it is. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's actually like almost, you're pretty much exactly hitting on what the show devs kind of like looks at. And it's made, made by the same guy who did Ex Machina, if you're familiar with that. He does yeah, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that yeah. stuff's cool. Um, yeah, definitely. But We're anyway, it, it's, such, it's such a world, if, if, we, if we get to that closer to those kind of points, uh, life will be more interesting for sure. Um, and people will have alternate lives that they live in these little online compartmented worlds, and they will matter more and more and more. And as we integrate with 3D printing and robots and AIs, then then that will become more and more real. Actually, one of my favorite books is a guy uh, by Daniel. I don't know if you ever heard of a. Uh, it's, it's got a Daniel Suarez. It's called uh, Damon. D A E M O N. I have not. It's a sci-fi novel by this guy. It was written about 10 years ago, but it was incredible about how he tried to envision what you could do with our current technology to create these sort of autonomous little worlds, right, that um, were on the edge of tech at the time, bleeding edge tech. But, uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I just – people that claim to know for sure, I'm always skeptical of them. People with imaginations and sci-fi writers, I admire them, and that's fine. Um, yeah. For for now, I, what I want is the government to stop killing people and to stop taking my stuff and to let yeah. me have my physical, normal, mundane, everyday stuff to myself and to leave it the hell alone. And if we can use Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency that they can't touch as a substitute or as a limit on government activity, I you know I can see that as a positive development. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Stefan. This has been thank you. Awesome. All right. I'm going to end this here now, guys, but I'll be happy to do this later if anyone's interested. And uh, I appreciate everyone's uh, interest in being so civil and nice and uh, thoughtful. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.